You know, there's a song, maybe you know it, goes, he knows my name. He knows more than your name. (laughs) I like the next line, he knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. Though he has named every star that he created and he calls them good, his crowning achievement in creation is mankind. When we really understand that and comprehend as much as we can how much he loves us, how can we not love our creator back and desire to live for him? Mark Lowry is a Christian singer and a comedian, a funny guy, but he's, he's a deep guy too. And uh, he always says, what's not to love? He, God is crazy about you. What's not to love about that? Let me encourage you this morning with just this one question. What are you doing with your dash? You know that little puny piece of punctuation you see in obituaries and on tombstones? That little dash between the two dates. What are you doing with your dash? And you know, this, this message, the title of this message is, Now is the Time to Fully Live for God. And it's probably what you hear every Sunday from Pastor Brad. It's, it's time. Now is the time to live for God. We have no guarantee of tomorrow. We need to live in the present. We tend to live in the past or in the future to the neglect of the present. We live in regret or disappointment in the past or, or we live in fear of the future or, or maybe we're looking forward to that next new car or our next new iPhone or that next new house, our dream house. I, I, love, I listened to uh, Larry Shelton's message from last week. Uh, talking about his forever home that they had in paradise, and it's all ashes now. And in fact, there's still some puzzle pieces here from last week. (laughs) Yeah, God has the big picture in mind, doesn't he? Uh, Just to kind of reiterate what he said last week. We need to look to the present, not to the past, not to the future. I like what he said last week. He said, God only gives you one piece of the puzzle each day. But we want to say, but what's my bank account going to look like next year? Or, you know, but God says, no. All you've got is today. We're going to do today together. Again, Mark Lowry says, uh, God is, he's the great I am. He's not the great I was. He's not the great I will be. But he's the great I am. He lives in the present. And we should too. God has called us to live a life with a clear conscience in the present as we practice our spiritual breathing found in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the key to following your shepherd and living in the present. And our hope for the future is knowing that we can trust the leading of our shepherd in this life and for what lies ahead in eternity. The Apostle Paul wrote about leaving those things which are behind, and he had lots to leave behind, didn't he? He had tried to put the church of Christ out of existence. He pressed forward. You think there was hope in his life? Yeah, there was a lot of hope in his life. I don't know about you, but I used to listen to oldies a lot. I mean, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and, uh, you know, I I love the music from back then, but I used to listen to that all the time. Then I realized, well, why would I want to? Why would I want to live there? Why would I want to live, relive those years? That's where a lot of disappointment and regret of the past keeps popping up when I listen to that music. So I decided that's not for me. And if it's for you, that's fine. But I just, I just don't want to be influenced and be thinking about what I was doing back in the '60s and early '70s and kind of made a mess of my life during those years. and I don't want to go back to that. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Do all to the glory of God. Ephesians 5.10, I love the way the NIV puts it. It says, Find out what pleases the Lord. Find out what pleases the Lord. If you want to look at Romans 12, I love these verses and You probably have memorized, I do too, but it's always good to read them. Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Again, finding out what pleases the Lord. If you want to please the Lord, don't just play, don't, don't just play church. Don't just play games. Um, you know, if you're just playing church and hiding behind a religious mask, uh, the Lord sees through that. He, he knows your heart. Remember, he knows your every thought. I did that for 17 years. Growing up, went to church and Sunday school every week. My parents took us and, and said, you're going to go until you're out of high school, and then you make your own decisions. But up till then, you're going with us. So we, I did. And to me, it was just something you did every Sunday. And I got to hang out with my friends. And but you know, I never heard the gospel. I never heard that Jesus died for me and that I could, re I could receive him and, and have salvation for my sins. I, I never knew that. I never heard that. All those years in church, I was just kind of playing a game. You know, that same Greek word, you arrest us, is the same word uh, for pleases and acceptable. So we're to find out what's acceptable, what pleases the Lord. How do we do that? We have the instruction manual right here. And I hope every one of you has one. The word acceptable is used many, many times in the New Testament, referring to what God finds acceptable. Romans 14, Romans 15, Philippians 4, several other passages. Uh, we don't have to wonder what a, God, a life that is pleasing to God looks like. And when you find out what pleases him, that's when you'll be serving the Lord with gladness. As Psalm 100 says, serve the Lord with gladness. When we were uh, getting premarital counseling, the pastor who, who counseled us had a little plaque on his desk that said, serve the Lord with gladness or don't serve him at all. The Lord knows our hearts. He knows our motivations. Is your life all about work? Or maybe it's all about serving the Lord out of guilt, <laughs> like you owe it to him. Well, we do it because we love him. Is the joy of the Lord your strength? John 15, 4 and 5 says, Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do a little bit, right? No. Without me, you can do nothing. So what's the application? A couple things. First of all, we all need wisdom for decisions. Whether you're eight or 88, there's no age limit to the promise in James that God will give you wisdom. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And Proverbs 4, 5 through 7 says, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. In all you're getting, get wisdom. Kind of an emphasis there, isn't it? <laughs> get understanding, get wisdom. We place way too much significance on insignificant things, don't we? Dancing with the stars, really? <laughs> the voice, American Idol. Um, how do you get wisdom? You get wisdom from the word of the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. It's not our understanding. And he will direct our paths. Secondly, what do you do when God's will is not crystal clear to you and you have a decision to make? 
You know, you've heard the cliche about open doors, closed doors. When God opens, closes one door, he opens another. You know, that's not biblical. <laughs> you, know that, you know where that comes from? It comes from the sound of music. You know, the mother superior told Maria, you know, when God closes one door, he opens. Anyway, don't get me started on that one. But that's just a cliche. But what if a door or a window doesn't open for you right away? Well, after prayer, time in the Word, getting godly counsel, maybe it's time to rattle some doorknobs. The Lord gave you a mind. Use it. We, uh, we kind of did that very thing several years ago, wanting to know, is this the area that you want us in, Lord? We don't know. We don't have a clear, a clear sign, you know, showing us this. So we rattled some doorknobs, and then the Lord opened doors. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. After prayer, don't be afraid to make a decision. Step out of the boat, like Peter, if that's what God is calling you to do. You might be amazed what God will do in and with your life. When it comes to ministry and direction in your life, make a move. See if God opens those doors. Some of you might be right there, right now, right at that spot where you don't know. Do I do, I do this for a job? Do I do this for a, a a move, something's going on in your life that you're wondering, what should I do? Well, maybe you need to rattle some doorknobs, see what happens. Mark Twain said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones you did do. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. And I would add, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Otherwise, it's just wood, hay, and stubble. So when's the last time you got out of your comfort zone and really stepped out into a new adventure with the Lord, if, if that's what the shepherd is calling you to do? You know, a ship, is a, a ship in the harbor is safe, but that's not what ships were built for. And any, any dead fish can float downstream. You're not a dead fish, are you? <laughs> say, say no. <laughs> no. Let's turn to the book of Esther. Esther 4. And some of you know where I'm going with this, probably. But Esther 4, verse 14. says, this is Mordecai speaking to Esther. It says, for if you remain completely silent at this time... Relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This could almost be called the book of Mordecai, you know, as much as it's called the book of Esther. He realized that his relative Esther, the queen, had been brought to this place of prominence for a reason. And that once she understood that, she knew what she needed to do. Look at that phrase that Mordecai uses. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Let me ask you that question today in reference to God's kingdom. You have been placed at this time in history to love and serve the Lord in this particular place, wherever you are. Serving the Lord with those in the sphere of your influence. Acts 17.26 uh, says that God planned where and when we would live. Do you know that? <laughs> There's a reason for that. God was not surprised when you were born. It was all planned, and everything we go through in our lives is because of his involvement, his love, his mercy, his care for us, whether in good times or hard times. The context of this verse in Acts is, is Paul's sermon in Athens, uh, is God's hand is sovereignly in control of the rise and fall of nations and empires. But we can apply this individually to ourselves because the purpose is the same. I mean, you look at verse 27, the very next verse says, so that they should seek the Lord. We are here in this place at this time for a purpose, to serve him, to make a difference in the lives of those around us. The first summer that I was a Christian, uh, back when I was 22 years old, 
uh, I went to a camp, and uh, they, they made me a camp counselor. I was a new Christian, but they, they made me a counselor. And on Friday night, you know, they had the, the, the campfire, and you throw the sticks in the fire and give a testimony. And this little pastor's daughter, 10 or 12 years old, she just started crying. And she gave her testimony, and she says, I see everything he did for me, and what have I done for the Lord? This is a young girl. What have I done for the Lord? Over and over, crying. What have I ever done for the Lord? That's been almost 50 years. I can still hear that little girl's voice in my head. What have I ever done for the Lord? When we look at what he's done for us. There's a song that says, How many kings step down from their thrones? How many lords have abandoned their homes? How many greats have become the least for me? How many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that has torn all apart? How many fathers gave up their sons for me? Only one did that for me. You know, the journey that you are on is your journey. It's not your parents. It's not your grandparents. It's not your boyfriend or girlfriends. Not even your spouses. How you choose to live before the Lord deep down in your soul is ultimately the responsibility that belongs to you alone. But in this journey that we all have to make, we are not alone if we belong to Jesus. God does not change. He isn't fickle. He loves you as much today as he did on your most your worst God-rejecting, rebellious day of your life. And he doesn't leave either. Hebrews 13, 5 tells us that he will never leave us or forsake us. I know Larry mentioned this last Sunday. But you know that verse in Hebrews 13, 5, it's actually a, a quintuple negative. It's like he will no, never, no, never, no, never <laughs> leave us. There's no way that he is going to leave you. When the Holy Spirit came to dwell in you, the moment you were saved, he came to stay. Isn't that reassuring? Even if you're in a backslidden state, he, the Holy Spirit, has not left you. There's a song from the 80s that said, he didn't bring us this far to leave us. He didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. He didn't build his home in us to move away. He didn't lift us up to let us down. Will you walk in the wisdom of the Lord? Do you feel like maybe you've wasted the best years of your life? Or maybe you feel like you've been just kind of coasting, drifting along through life in your relationship with Jesus? There's another song. Can you tell I like songs, I like music? <laughs> There's a song that Matthew West did a few years ago. It says, I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to go one more day without your all-consuming passion inside me. I don't want to spend my whole life asking, what if I had given everything instead of going through the motions? Maybe the best years of your life are starting right now, this morning. And if you, I don't know all of you. Maybe there's someone here who just came to visit and you don't know the Lord. You've never had a personal relationship with him. You've never had your sins forgiven and had the Holy Spirit come to live inside you and guide you and direct you and illuminate the word of God to your heart. You can do that this morning before we leave. I would love to talk to you or a pastor would. But do you care enough about your future, the remainder of your life, that you will make conscious decisions that will take your life in the direction that the Lord is leading you? Will you live intentionally is it time to turn off the autopilot? Uh, like Larry said last week, you know, God had a plan. He saw the big picture. Maybe we don't, but we can live for today. We can do today together with God. Because someday, the legacy you're building right now will be the legacy that you leave behind. Are you willing this morning to say, I surrender all? To say, Lord, 
I want what you want for my life. I want to be the man of God or the woman of God that you created me to be, one who will live for your glory. So I ask you once more, what are you doing with your dash?